All right, everybody. Welcome to the latest edition of the Green Star Business Webinar Series. I coined this the It's Raining Plastic, Now What presentation. Dr. Jim Ranville will be uh, leading it, but we're going to go through some housekeeping first before we get started. If I can figure out how to change my slides. There we go. <laughs> so, um, for announcements wise, we're going to be having another presentation, uh, not next week, most likely there's a snafu with scheduling. So the next presentation will be July uh, 22nd at 1030. I'll go over details with that about that at the end. So please hang on till after the presentation and after the Q&A. Um, after our little announcements that I'm going to run through, we'll do the presentation. We'll have a Q&A after. So please go ahead, look at the bottom of your screen. You'll see a, a question and answer button. As uh, Dr. Ramville speaking, please go ahead Add your questions to that. We'll ask them at the end. Um, any issues that you have, go ahead and add them into the chat box and we'll see if we can take care of them as far as technology goes. And then I'll talk about next steps after the presentation and the Q&A. So a little bit of background, the Green Star Business Program is a network of businesses that self-selected to be leaders in sustainability in their given field. Based on peer-to-peer uh, -peer support and learning. Uh, so we have some really great businesses that have been taking steps forward, whether it's uh, packaging related, employee engagement related. Um, these are the steps that they're taking. Here actually are the members that we have right now. Move this guy over. So we have 22 businesses right now that we work with. We're not just in Boulder County. We go outside of Boulder County as well since we go where the need is. So if there are any questions that you have related to the Green Star Business Network, please go ahead, shoot me an email when this is done. I don't know if you're listening to the chit chat at the beginning of this presentation, but there are two Kates now at EcoCycle. So please make sure you add the C at the end of my name. Uh, if you do have questions about the Green Star Business Network. Now, Dr. Jim Ranville is gonna take it away. He's a professor in the chemistry department at the Colorado School of Mines, and he's about to blow our mind about microplastics. Thank you, Kate. We'll see how much mind blowing will actually happen here, uh, as opposed to general confusion. Uh, let me uh, just um, get this going here. Um, and a little bit of a introduction here. Uh, Kate, I'm assuming that we're now seeing my presentation. I'm seeing it. So let's see here. Laser pointer is, there we go. All right, well, thank you all. Um, the title that, uh, that Kate generated, it's raining microplastics, now what? I said uh, might be, uh, it's raining plastics, now what or so what? Uh, we'll see if we talk as we talk through this, maybe some of the implications of this uh, and what we know whether uh, currently and where we are planning on going in the future. So this is really just a little bit of an introduction to the basics of microplastics and some science questions. And particularly at the end, I'm going to talk about some of the questions we're just starting to look at. Uh, I am at uh, School Minds. Uh, this is a current photo uh, of what the campus looks like today. Uh, okay maybe 100 years ago um, but my work has been looking more at metals in the environment things like lead and copper things that might be of concern but uh, how is it that I'm dealing with microplastics now well because many of those metals that I've been looking at over the years uh, are on fine particles and these fine particles can move these uh, materials around in the environment, either in rivers or in the atmosphere. These are two studies uh, that we've been involved in recently. This is actually a sunscreen uh, project uh, on, on uh, Clear Creek, but the same thing is happening with Boulder Creek. If we want to talk later about how much sunscreen is entering the environment through, through recreational use of rivers, we can chat about that. Uh, the atmospheric uh, work uh, is kind of what dovetailed into my work with uh, Greg Weatherby at USGS, who uh, was the lead author on a, a small report we did that 
inspired the title is, is raining plastics. So coming from a, 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 the world of, of looking at particles, but not necessarily plastics, uh, uh, at least not until recently. Um, so where do we start? I think this group probably doesn't even need to know uh, or see this slide with respect to the idea that um, uh, a lot of the plastics we make don't get recycled, get discarded. This was a paper by Roland Geyer et al. Uh, about 15 year, uh, in 2015. And they, they tried to you know, make measurements or I should say estimates of all the plastics ever made. Uh, and so if you look at these numbers, they're in crazy units, millions of tons. So to the be their best estimate since uh, 1950 until 2015, so this is now five years out of date, um, 8.3 billion tons of plastic has been generated. And if we look at what's happened to that, well, about 2.5 billion are still in use. They're in you know things we're we're still using our cars, our buildings, whatever. Um, the unfortunate part of the slide is the 4.6 billion, or I'm sorry, 4.9 billion that is being uh, discarded into the environment. And certainly, our our hosts here today uh, are really concerned about this part of the loop. And sadly, you know, when you talk about 8.3 billion versus 600 million, uh, we're still not doing a great job of of looping this stuff around. And so um, uh, again, this is a discussion for, for EcoCycle and others as to how do we make any kind of impact here. Um, but today we're talking about this, this category, the stuff that kind of goes out into the world. Uh, and uh, I'm really interested in the idea of microplastics. And so we'll talk about that in uh, more detail, of course. Um, Again, a slide that perhaps everyone in this group is already kind of familiar with, but packaging is certainly the biggest uh, use of plastics. Um, there's a whole hodgepodge of other things, so you can just kind of throw all these various categories into this generic other section. Textiles and then uh, these kind of products, and then it drops off pretty quickly into the sort of more industrial uses. So again, nobody really needs to be reminded that we have uh, packaging uh, issues that uh, are really driving a lot of our concerns. You know, I could have, I could show endless photos of plastic bottles floating around in rivers or oceans. We've all seen those, but uh, um, those, are, those are our sources. <clears throat> Who's producing plastic? Uh, this is from a really interesting site, Our World of Data. You can find lots of very useful graphics and, uh, and statistics on any number of topics. In this case, it's plastic pollution. So, um, if you look at the per capita production 10 years ago now, you see some of the Western countries are more highlighted. But this is uh, really who's, who's producing it. Uh, if we're more concerned about, again, where is it going in the environment? Well, from the same study, if you look at this map, this is the plastic waste available to enter in the ocean in a million metric tons. And there's a number of things that go into this plot. If you notice the previous one, it kind of was shifted to the west. In this case, it slips a little bit towards the east. This study tried to estimate, again, mismanaged plastic waste and people living within 50 kilometers of the coast. So in other words, you know, uh, this, this was a study uh, focused on the ocean, it's the thing that gets the most press. You know, we see photos of uh, turtles and fishing nets and things like that. Uh, and certainly it's a huge problem, but my particular work is gonna turn ourselves more towards back to closer to home in, in, in ur urban and, um, and uh, terrestrial environments. But back to the point is that uh, uh, this is the region that seems to have a greater impact on um, plastic materials getting into the ocean. I think everybody has heard of Mount Everest for sure, and most people have probably heard of the Mariana Trench. And I just, this was just a fun fact I came across as you know, you're searching, looking through the popular literature. And the question was, what did the deepest submarine dive in history find? Uh, plastic. And so uh, uh, this is just to highlight the ubiquitousness of, of, this, of this issue that this uh, quite, uh, it can get pretty much everywhere. And we're gonna talk about a new compartment that we haven't really studied so much in the past, which is the atmosphere. So this is my uh, science slide. 
Um, what are we talking about? Microplastic is defined for lack of better terms as a plastic which is less than five millimeters. So I think we can all picture five millimeters. That's the upper end of the plastic scale. What's a little hard to picture and I'm gonna show on my next slide is what's the lower size limit? So anything bigger or smaller than five millimeters is considered a microplastic. And there can be primary ones, ones that were made that small to begin with. Uh, but a lot of, uh, luckily, a lot of the microbeads, some of you may have heard about that were in cosmetics have been banned. And so there's less production of, of microplastics uh, on purpose. But the secondary microplastics are the ones that if you're just breaking down uh, a larger piece of plastic, you're gonna yield these microplastics. Let's go even smaller, and, and this is the realm I've been working in in terms of, of the metals, is we, there's something we call nanomaterials, things that are even smaller. So take that microplastic and break it down by a factor of 1,000 or 5,000 times, and now you're generating something called uh, nanoplastics. Of course, we talk about polymers. Those are the building blocks of plastic, so there's literally uh, thousands of different polymers. Um, and uh, finally, the, the last term I'm going to bring in because it's relevant to my uh, future work is their polymer additives. I think uh, probably the biggest uh, one that most people hear about is like BPA. And people talk about getting rid of BPA from plastics. Well, that's only one of thousands of chemicals that are added to, to the polymer to do things like make it stiffer, make it more flexible, give it a color, uh, make it uh, not break down. So uh, the the combination of the different plastics, the different additives lead to the fact that there's, we're not talking about microplastic as a single entity. Uh, it's, it's a class of things. And so they're all manner of different types of, of uh, microplastics out there when you talk about the chemical makeup of, of, of microplastics. Uh, so I really wanna talk a little bit about this idea, concept of size because uh, it, it starts to become a little bit mind-blowing to use that term when you start thinking about the scale of things. And so this is a slide I typically use in my, some of my nano geoscience classes where we talk about some very small particles in the environment. But if we roughly look at this and say, okay, a tennis ball is about six centimeters or so. Let's step down in steps of 10. So we go from 10 centimeters to one, from one centimeter to one millimeter and so on. We can start to see, well, okay, if I have a tennis ball, I could maybe put about a hundred uh, pins or so somewhere there across there. So imagine that uh, pin head sitting right there. So I've gone from uh, a tennis ball, maybe by a factor of almost a hundred smaller. Then you think, well, a pin compared to human hair. Well, human hair is much finer than a, than a pin. So that's about a factor of 10. Keep going smaller. We can start getting the world of red blood cells. Uh, I used to have something else sitting here uh, to represent 100 nanometers, but now it's a timely uh, topic that about 60 nanometers or so is about your average virus uh, particle. And then when we get, again, another factor of 10, we finally get down to uh, things like DNA, the molecules that make up a coronavirus or an RNA, I guess I should change that. Um, so we talk about millimeters to micrometers, so 1,000 and then another thousand is nanometers. And I just, to, again, kind of put this in the context, if we wanted to look at relative scale, so instead of going down from a tennis ball to a DNA, go the other way, go up from a tennis ball to the moon, and that's about the same range. So I'm sitting on the moon staring at a tennis ball, or I'm sitting on a tennis ball trying to stare at a, a piece of uh, DNA. So the scales are, 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 are similar, so I don't know if that, helps or confuses, but that's the kind of scale we're talking about when we go from say a micro or you know a, a bulk plastic breaking down into these small particles. So again, just a little bit of background on me, where I come in, into this research, uh, now geoscience is an area I'm looking at, take that nanoparticle and think about how it behaves in the environment. And so these small particles play an important role in both the natural world uh, we didn't start making particles when people started uh, the Industrial Revolution, um, but they are important in the human-influenced environment. So 
I'm hoping everyone gets to the mountains on a regular basis and maybe occasionally they go through towns that were uh, mining towns like this is Blackhawk, Colorado. Um, and so some of the work we did was looking at the small particles that were coming out of the mine. And luckily this mine underwent some treatment. So a couple months later, the water really cleared up. And so it's quite a, quite a success story there. But these particles were carrying things like copper and cadmium, other things like that. Uh, the nanoparticles in dust was a study that I won't spend any real time on, but it, it was the bridge between the world of where I was working with mostly river systems to now thinking a little bit more about the atmosphere. And this is one of my students, Katie Chalice. Katie, um, who just uh, graduated with her PhD. So, but back to plastics. Uh, so let's, let's think about, um, again, these definitions. Now, you're keeping in mind that this here's our scale. Uh, we had the, the tennis ball somewhere around here, a couple of centimeters, and then uh, here was our virus, uh, well, smaller than our viruses. But so, uh, you have mega plastics, the things that you might uh, recognize, giant fishing nets that uh, are lost overboard uh, that are real problems. Probably most of what we're worried about are macro plastics, you know, things that you know, our shopping bag and our bottle. Uh, as we go smaller and smaller, of course, now we've got... Uh, uh, these micro bees that used to be in, in cosmetics. And then we have things that are truly small. Uh, carbon, this is a carbon nanotube, which is um, barely, I would barely consider that a plastic. But I think the, the, the part that I can't answer, answer in this talk is this connection between, okay, different organisms are going to have problems with different materials. So again, choking a whale with a with a, a plastic bag versus looking at the zooplankton, the small organisms that are living in the ocean that are getting eaten, of course, on the way up. Uh, but how are these microplastics affecting these critters? Certainly, you know, we don't need to see too many more pictures to know that these megaplastics do lead to consequences. You know, things get entangled, things ingest them, and, and then, you know, their systems are, are upset, or, you know, packing their gut. Um, the question right down here is, we still don't know that much about what happens if um, small organisms ingest microplastics. Sure, there are many studies ongoing, but you know, as is often the case, uh, when you start to answer a new question, you start in a lab, somewhere where you can control conditions. And so I would argue that I still have this question mark here. And so what we really want to know is, <laughs> is it, uh, is rain plastic, uh, uh, you know, so uh, what's next or, or so what? Um, and so that's part of our, our future work is, is, you know, what's the implication? We know this material is out here and we know these people, these critters are out here, but how do you connect that to hazard? Um, again, the bulk of the work over the past has been thinking about how rivers uh, transport plastic to the oceans. You know, we all, you know, you look at the side of a, of a street and look at the storm drains and the, and, the, and the gutters and you see all kinds of plastic. So it's not uh, too surprising to think that, that rivers would not only be a, a conveyor belt for large plastics, but these microplastics that we're eventually going to talk a little more about. So um, these have really been the areas of, of study is the, ter the terrestrial environment, our urban environments to the ocean. And that's where most work has gone. From this paper, they highlighted that some of the trends in the research, though, now are kind of going back the other way. You know, uh, not to say we should stop studying plastics in the ocean by any means, but maybe we need to also look a little closer to home what's going on. There have been some studies of wastewater treatment plants, and you think about, okay, plastics are getting in, uh, you know, into storm drains or maybe down the drain. You can certainly picture that big plastics aren't going to make it through a wastewater treatment plant. But even some of these small plastics are. Treatment plants are pretty good, but there's always going to be some plastic going to surface water. Uh, what also happens, though, is some of this plastic winds up in the sludge, which can be applied for fertilizers. And then, of course, there's a runoff mechanism. So there's other ways uh, to uh, get the plastic uh, from us, because there are no natural sources, um, to the marine environment. But um, and we've known this for a while. It's not like uh, someone just discovered plastics last week. Uh, there was a paper in 1969 
where someone said, you know, when they opened up the stomachs of an albatross, there was all this stuff. So uh, um, that was the idea of plastic pollution. These smaller particles, these uh, pellets, uh, there were a couple articles again, uh, quite a few years ago now, 1972, uh, and I just quoted that one particular paper, Carpenter and Smith, uh, they found up to 3,500 pieces and 290 grams per square kilometer. I think in 1972, they were just seeing really big chunks. They had no idea of the small materials. So these numbers are ridiculously small. But they were seeing this. And that it also leads to this idea, well, they're brittle, maybe because they're weathering. So that's going to kind of tie into some of my work. And, um, and so uh, they already had this idea that we're probably going to be breaking up particles and their prediction was, uh, what, a, what a surprise, huh? That increased production of plastics is gonna uh, wind up lead to increases in the concentrations. So, um, and they were also worried about uh, things like that uh, BPA and things like that as early as 1972. So um, we haven't obviously solved the problem, uh, but um, it's, it's, it's been a historical fact, not a, a new finding that this is an issue. So, uh, going back to thinking about that that size scale a little bit, here's just an image of some 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 uh, microplastics. Uh, the idea of everything less than five millimeters. Uh, some of these long fibery things might not quite classify as microplastics. The the definition is the biggest dimension should be five millimeters. But this is the kind of stuff we're looking at. And um, if we got, if we aren't making microplastics so much anymore, we're letting nature make them. What's really happening is different chemical processes. There's that polymer that makes up the plastic. You know, it can just be ground by wave action on a beach. It can react with water. That's the process of hydrolysis to break down. Some bacteria can start to chew on it. Uh, oxygen from the air can attack it. And what we're studying or will be studying is sunlight can break it down. So you take a big plastic bottle, let's say, you make these fragments, and then um, these would be our micro and nanoplastics. And if if nature were a little more kind, uh, the bacteria might break this stuff down into harmless components like carbon dioxide. Although let's not talk about climate change here at the moment. Uh, but so the issue is, is that for the most part, this is really really slow. And people talk about plastic lasting forever. Well, there's some studies that say maybe not forever, unless you know, 600, 700 years in your mind uh, is forever. Um, but uh, they may not, uh, uh, people talk about, will these be in the geologic record? Will some future civilization be able to fingerprint our presence on the earth by a layer of plastic? Uh, I think in, in the million year scheme, it probably will go away, but uh, I don't think any of us can see that far in the future. So, Thoughts about size and number again. Uh, the moon is our mega plastic now, and our tennis ball is our microplastic. How many tennis balls can you make out of the moon? Um, the point being that uh, you know we can when we start talking about finding the number of plastics, you know if they're small particles, we can make a lot out of out of something. And so uh, one moon equals I can't even do this calculation myself many, many trillions of tennis balls. So now back to the title of this, it's raining plastic. This idea of transport by air is, is relatively new compared to say that 1972 study of the ocean. And so uh, this paper by Rachman Holling um, uh, illustrated in a very sort of cartoon way, some of the places or ways uh, plastics can cycle. We already talked about like fresh waters, like can we basically, uh, you know, run off from, from uh, surfaces in cities, uh, discharge from wastewater treatment plants, we kind of know that. But if we think about uh, the other possibilities, you know, it's raining plastic, but it's also sea spray and other things can be aerosolized to get, bring it back up. So we kind of have a cycle here and then we can certainly think about uh, wind erosion. Uh, we get some pretty windy days here in Colorado when the dust is blowing strongly. Uh, and so you can imagine that now we've got another uh, pathway for plastics, not just to go to the ocean. Again, uh, this is sort of like the, you know, the, the final sink of plastics. But if we are interested in, again, uh, freshwater systems like mountain streams, mountain lakes, uh, our exposure, 
then um, this is a new and kind of unstudied, relatively unstudied area uh, is this uh, atmospheric uh, transport. Um, you know, about the only way to explain the fact that people are finding uh, plastics in places like the Arctic and high in the mountains. This is uh, the mountains of, of Switzerland and, uh, and, um, and Austria. There's places uh, in the far north up near the Arctic Circle. And so when they look at these different places, um, if you look at this, this value of the number, n is the number of plastics per volume of solution, so number per liter. In some cases, you know, you don't have much, but in some cases you might have thousands of particles in a liter, or even tens of thousands in this one sample from Bavaria. Um, this study actually defined microfibers, the kinds of things you might get out of your clothing. Uh, uh, they looked at those versus, say, amorphous -y kind of just pieces of plastic. And so in some cases, even though there weren't very many um, uh, small particles of plastic, there were tons of fibers here. You look at these numbers, and again, it's kind of hard to wrap your head around this, like 150,000 particles in just a liter bottle. Think of your, your water bottle. Well, again, I remember the tennis ball. Uh, if these are very, very small particles, I can have tens of thousands of these particles in my drinking water bottle and not have much mass. And so uh, that's where, when you do particle research, you have to start thinking about this. You know, um, these numbers, it seems almost inconceivable I could have hundreds of thousands of particles in a bottle of water when it still looks clear. Uh, well, that's the beauty of that, again, the turning the moon into a tennis ball. So finally, where I come in in a small way at this point was a colleague of mine at USGS was examining the, the Denver urban area. And as often the case in science, he was not looking at plastics in any way. Uh, this was part of a program that's studying nitrogen across the, um, the U.S. And uh, nitrogen does a couple of things. You know, it can, it can make uh, rainwater more acidic. You know, certainly a nutrient uh, we'd like to know about. Uh, think about your nitrogen fertilizers. So they were studying um, nitrogen and they were sampling rainwater. And usually what you do is you filter the rainwater sample before you measure the amount of nitrogen in there. Well, you know, um, here's uh, one of the sites uh, in uh, Denver. Notice I forgot to mention, uh, there were sites all the way up to Rocky Mountain National Park, uh, some up here near Boulder, uh, a Rocky Flats site, and then the urban site. So the idea was, is as you go away from what would be a main source of nitrogen, how far does that, uh, that uh, fingerprint of nitrogen extend? So anyway, uh, getting back to the, the, the science, um, there are ways of collecting uh, two types of deposition is dry deposition, the dust that just kind of fall all the time, versus wet deposition where your sample only collects during the rain. And I won't go into details there, but you can study basically um, uh, things are coming down both as dust and as rain or just as rain. And I mentioned that you want to filter your sample before um, you do your nitrogen analysis. Well, so Greg started noticing that, you know, again, not a big surprise, but some of these sites, including some of the sites quite far from the urban area, uh, have a lot of material on the filter. And so when you look at that filter, instead of uh, just throwing it away, and I think they probably ran the study for years where those filters were never even looked at, uh, you know, that was not the point of the study, but you start seeing um, all this stuff. And Microplastics are not a, uh, an easy thing to study. Um, what we use are color and shape usually. So, you know, there's a shape, a uh, fiber. There are these kind of funny shapes here, but their colors are quite brilliant. Um, you try to use, you try to d differentiate from things like, just imagine all the other kinds of things that might be in the, in, in the wind blowing around, pollen from trees, uh, fragments of stuff from uh, vegetation. Some of those things look like fibers. Uh, my garden is looking beautiful during the COVID uh, isolation. I have lots of blue and red flowers out there, but usually as soon as you uh, cut those and give them a day or two, those pigments go away. And so one way of trying to tack, uh, you know, to identify plastics is that nice bright red particle and that little blue particle are highly unlikely to be natural. 
And so uh, we can start to, 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 to uh, use color as an identifier, but it's a little bit like that, uh, the old saying of finding a needle in a haystack, you know, so much natural dust is out there that you have to try to pick out uh, the, the, the particles because it's quite easy to observe these things. But what if I wanted to say, well, how many pounds of fiber is raining out of the sky in a month? Now I have to have a number. And those numbers, you know, uh, I won't go through all the details of how these folks uh, determined that, but uh, they certainly would have used some type of uh, uh, visualization to, to come up with those numbers. So um, that was a small study that, uh, that I helped Greg with a little bit. And then along uh, the, during the same time, uh, I was not collaborating on the study, but uh, Greg was, I believe. Um, but they started looking more broadly across the West. And again, the idea is, sure, if you're gonna sample in Denver, uh, you, do you think it's a surprise to see plastics in the air in Denver? I don't think anyone was, would be shocked by that. But what I think the impact of this, of this study, and you, know, you don't get published in this journal Science, which is essentially the most prestigious journal in, in science, and it doesn't just do environmental stuff, it's everything from biology to geology. Uh, you have to have an impactful study. And, and this is, again, a little bit eye-opening in that you go to these various protected areas, national parks, wildernesses, other areas that are really limited in the human contact uh, and you take away pretty much the, the localized, direct impact of humans. And so, again, they, I mentioned you can look at wet deposition, just what, how many fibers came out in the rain, how many fibers were just blowing around in the dry dust, the particles, and so on and so forth. It's, this is one of the, the samplers. You know, they're usually placed up above the ground to avoid contamination from just you know, surface, surface dust and things like that. So... Um, the sides of the bar, the pie charts reflect uh, the, the amount of material that they found, and then the, the pie slices tell you, for example, Rocky Mountain, it was mostly dry fibers that they found. Uh, maybe uh, it's a little bit different in some other areas. Um, if you look at another graph, uh, here was some of the uh, specific sites, and we have how much plastic, and this is in terms of number of particles now, so when you look at it under a microscope, you count them, you say, okay, now I want to normalize that. I, I counted a thousand particles, and that was over one square meter, and I let the sampler go for 30 days, so I divide by 30, and it gives you units of how much stuff is raining down over an area over a given time. And it looks like Rocky Mountain National Park is the winner in this group as far as the uh, number of plastics uh, found um, uh, in, with these units of number of plastics um, per square meter per day. I kind of mentioned before, just, uh, you know, maybe we want to know how much mass of plastic is coming down. And that, again, becomes a difficult challenge. How do you turn those, it's not too hard to count particles. Well, I should, it is how hard to count particles, but you can do it. But then trying to convert that to mass. And so that's still an area of, 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 of work. And I'll mention that in one of my slides is now I get into the real science mode. How do we measure these things better? Uh, everything in science is uncertain. This is what they measured. But I think even the authors would argue that, it's, you know, is it really 400? You know, these little bars here represent multiple measurements and taking an average, but still uh, you could be missing things. And so these are our best estimates of, of plastic at the moment uh, coming down. And again, none of these would have a direct, uh, really strong urban signature. You can argue Grand Canyon, Rocky Mountain National Park have roads and campgrounds and things like that. But the study really said, and it's, it's, it's really, um, a follow up to the things we saw earlier with the Arctic and some other areas is that uh, natural environments um, are experiencing plastics coming into the system. And then you think about the, where I started the talk with rivers. Uh, so think of the rivers draining each of these natural areas uh, being another conveyor belt for moving those plastics, uh, uh, if, if not all the way to the ocean to other areas 
from where they were deposited. So if I hadn't already kind of uh, uh, beat the drum for better methodology, I'll just put it out right here. One of the research questions is how could we measure the microplastics more effectively? And so, you know, they're particles. And so usually what happens is you try to sieve them and, and, and run through different sizes. And uh, usually you stop at the point where you take um, a look at the fibers, you use the morphology, the shape, the size, the color to start counting them. So over here are some examples of things they found that not only do they have these odd colors, that you wouldn't necessarily expect to persist in nature, but some of these look like they they're too nice and spherical to have maybe just formed by a bigger plastic breaking apart like this or this. So we probably still have some of these micro beads out in the environment, uh, even though we're not really making them much anymore. Um, and so they stick around for a while. So these look awfully, awfully perfect. But, you know, just imagine uh, seeing counting particles under a microscope eight hours a day for, for weeks. So I'm not going to talk at all about the chemistry of uh, how we might move this forward, but there are a number of people thinking about different ways of using a chemical technique called spectroscopy to, uh, to look for uh, something that looks like plastics. Um, okay, without going off the deep end in, in, in the chemistry analysis of these things, but one of the problems is plastics made out of carbon, so are you and I, so is every plant on the planet, and so uh, the chemists would like to find an element that's very unique, like when I was doing my work with lead or copper or cadmium, I, I had no problem uh, saying, hey, that lead is lead. Uh, if you just tried to measure the carbon in a plastic, you wouldn't know the carbon in the plastic from the carbon in a, a plant fat uh, fiber. So we have to have better methods or more sophisticated methods. And there is work uh, ongoing, but still much, much of every, anything you read in the literature about microplastics, most of it's going to involve some type of counting, uh, and that's not necessarily uh, totally true, but that's where we, the basis from where we're coming from. Um, finally coming to where I, my upcoming work is coming in, and that is we focused on plastics, but I alluded a little bit earlier about things like most people are aware of BPA as an additive that they don't want to have in their water bottle. Uh, and so uh, microplastics are filled with chemicals. And so imagine these microplastics moving around, carrying these chemicals as a cargo. We know that some of these compounds have uh, toxicological effects. And that really leads to these research questions of if the plastics are moving around the world, what about the plasticizers that make the material soft, the flame retardants, uh, the antioxidants, the uh, inorganic fillers, uh, pigments uh, for color, all these chemicals, some of them are problematic uh, and some may not be problematic. So finally, a slide that I can claim uh, uh, really highlights my upcoming work, and I do mention upcoming work because we just uh, got our first grant in this area in this month. Um, and the idea behind our new work is we know sunlight is a major contributor to the degradation of plastics, but um, without going into details, the kind of other chemicals are dissolved in, in stream water some of these things being just, uh, is the water salty? Is it fresh water? Is it uh, you know, high in organic matter? Is it low? These other components also interact. And so this is some of my science cartoons over here. But the things we're gonna look at is, as a, a big plastic breaks down subsequently into a microplastic, are some of these things that we added to them released into the environment? And then uh, you can imagine that if a chemical is sort of locked up inside a plastic, it's difficult to see how that might be of an environmental concern. But as you do the degradation, if these are released to the environment, then imagine things like, here's our, our BPA again. Um, this is bisphenol, it's actually bisphenol S, not A, it's a slightly different compound. But uh, is that gonna come out and be of issue to the uh, environment? The other thing we're hoping to look at, but we haven't had a decision on our funding request, is to look at some the same parameters that lead to the release of additives, uh, how do they also play a role in forming the microplastics, breaking these things apart? And so we'll see where all that goes. So uh, as part of this work, uh, I was talking to Kate before the seminar started, we hope to engage the public in this, uh, get some students interested in sampling their local rivers. Uh, I don't know how far we can 
take some of the chemical measurements of these additives, but we can certainly talk about uh, how the plastics are, are uh, being spread in the environment and maybe uh, get some kids counting, uh, counting things under a microscope. Uh, that would be great fun. So this is kind of the future. We're not the only ones thinking about this, but uh, uh, again, I, I, the point of this, this particular proposal is to go, or project is to go beyond tracing the plastics, but tracing some of the other things that, that are along for the ride. So this, I'm a scientist, but I'm aware that our science has to help the public good, but I also am not in a position to tell you here's a solution to microplastics. Uh, none of us need to, uh, we all know the first point is that folks like EcoCycle and others are trying to tackle, if, if it ain't out there, it isn't gonna fall apart into microplastics. Uh, I think if we know a little bit more about what happens to plastics in the environment, uh, we might maybe design them better. Uh, there's the question, do we want them to fall apart more, make them biodegradable? Or we rather maybe, uh, this may sound awful, but maybe we wanna keep them intact and lock those chemicals up in the plastic so that they don't come out. So maybe we want that bottle to sit around for a thousand years. Like I said, that doesn't sound very good. So I won't think I, I'll go too far down that bullet point. But um, so we do know that they're out there. Uh, in, a, in the world of risk assessment, we talk about exposure and hazard. You have to have both. If you, you know, if there's a, some really nasty toxic chemical, but you don't get exposed to it, there's no risk. If there's a, a benign chemical, but you get, tons of it exposed to you, maybe there's still a risk. So we're getting better about knowing what's out there, but there's still some questions about the environmental hazard. So that just to final, uh, wrap up, I, I got a few slides from two of my ex-students, um, as one does, and I'm happy to try to answer any questions uh, in kind of the world of particles, uh, and I'd even maybe be express opinions on some of the other things, but uh, uh, the, the life cycle of plastics is not something that, uh, that I know more than, than all of you know, that uh, let's, let's try to keep it out of our environment. And I thank you all for your attention. Wonderful, thank you so much for all of that. That was enlightening, mildly troubling, and, <laughs> <laughs> and interesting at the very least. Um, please folks, go ahead, add any questions that you have into the chat function down at the bottom chat or the Q&A and I'll make sure that we ask those. Um, I'm still personally processing a good amount of that information. I'm not going to call you out or go into that. Let's keep those water bottles along, around longer, but you know. That <laughs> <laughs> I say that, that you didn't hear it here. <laughs> <laughs> There's definitely, uh, you can see where you're going with that guy. Um, I'm going to throw a couple links into the chat box for everybody, a link to uh, the paper that you co-authored that originally highlighted what's going on in the National Park, uh, it's raining plastics, and then also something else that I'm going to take this uh, moment to chat about real fast. Dr. Ramos mentioned reduce, reuse, recycle, that's, you know, the R's. There's more than three now, we have a bunch of them, I'm not going to get into that too terribly much. But if you're looking for ways to reduce plastic in your life, please make sure to head over to the EcoCycle website and sign up for Plastic Free July Challenge. You'll have a bunch of tips going on throughout July that will help you cut back in your life on plastic, which is awesome. Um, and then I think there are going to be some goodies that you find out about as well, um, as far as like uh, documentary screenings go. So that would be a pretty awesome thing for you to take advantage of. Now let's see which questions we're getting. All right. So this is from MG, one of our EcoCycle uh, staffers who is incredibly intelligent, works with kiddos, and does some great work. She asked, what do you think are the top three steps uh, that we can take to continue the focus of your work in the community? Uh, I think, you know, the, we don't have to preach too much more about the need to, you know, like the three R's or the multiple R's now. Uh, I think the challenge becomes that uh, it gets a little science-y maybe when you start talking about additives and things like that. And so we need to come up with some good educational materials that kind of, 
translate to those kinds of more difficult concepts of uh, oh, why does sunlight make plastic break down? Well, let's let's you know let's design some some good educational materials. Uh, there's different ways we could maybe demonstrate that, but I think we got to bring the science part. Um, a lot of times, science is a scary part, right? Oh, I can't understand that. Uh, but uh, we we can we can we can work on that, and I'm totally keen on on trying to go from a concept which I think is something everyone can embrace, uh, you know, recycling and, and reusing, to this photos of of again seals with entangled uh, in nets. Uh, but those are the obvious things. Then we got to say, well, look at these little organisms, and and so I don't know if that was three things or not, but basically. I, find a way to bridge the science part uh, into the general general pub public. And kids are smart, right? And they, they'll they take on, uh, uh, you know, I know many of us, uh, some of us love science as a kid and kept that going. And I think most kids have a, a real interest in the natural world. And, and so let's just uh, work together, uh, bridging the gap between the nerd scientists and the, the kids in school, which are so excited. They're excited about this and they're gonna, they're going to save the world for us, we hope. All right, we got a couple other questions here. Um, this one's nice. It comes with a positive exclamation. Awesome comment. Do you have a plan on how to roll this up to big businesses who are the primary producers of packaging? I would like to answer that one. I'd love you to answer that one. <laughs> So the work that we're doing in the Green Star Business uh, Program is we're helping guide businesses um, in whatever their sustainability efforts are. So first off, a lot of companies are going to look at um, business through the end lens, obviously of marketing. Let's let's be honest about that. There's a lot to be said for being able to market yourself as a sustainable brand. So we kind of capitalize on that a little bit, move them closer towards you know, employee engagement and making sure that their bins are in the right spots in their business. And then as they're doing that, they're already starting to ask themselves those big questions. And we can start to tackle things like plastics and packaging. Um, one of the cool pilots that we're working on right now with Avery uh, Brewing, one of the Green Star businesses in the network, is a, a recycling program for their polypropylene uh, grain bags. They come from malters specifically. So they're not actually purchasing the packaging, but in a way they are because they have to have the product that's stored in it. So what we're doing is we're creating a bridge by recycling this material in a hard to recycle facility like Charm here at EcoCycle. Um, and then working with the folks that are the stakeholders in the brewing industry, like the Brewers Association, the local mal malters, the brewers, and then trying to address the packaging issue from that, uh, that level, right? So we're creating the Band-Aid in recycling, and then we're looking farther upstream to figure out how, what are the alternatives to that type of bag. So you can't really jump into it necessarily, well, you can, but I don't know that you're gonna get very far. By working with a business, starting at the basic level, making sure they know how to recycle and how to compost, then you make that step up the ladder and try to get them to packaging. Um, so if there are businesses where you're saying, I don't like their packaging, send them my way. Again, KateC at EcoCycle.org. We'll see if we can fix them up. Um, all right, here's another one. So with all this great information about the creation, existence, and growing impact on health and biodiversity, what, in your opinion, is the best way to engage the public slash our employees? I've tried environment, cost savings, et cetera. Other ideas, things like consumer habits and future generational market share? Yeah, you know, so from my perspective, we're just trying to maybe work on, again, the environmental angle. Do these chemicals um, that we currently use get in the environment or not? And we don't know the answer to this yet. So let's, let's take a positive, upbeat view uh, uh, that these, Plastics, they're, they're around for a, re for a long time for a reason. Um, although, you know, the idea would, oh, let's translate this back to like, okay, should I find a better additive, something that's more environmentally safe to put in my plastic? But if I'm gonna find an alternative, then you have the whole study of, well, does this work as well? 
uh, and so one could argue that like, worst case scenario is we find a lot of these chemicals come out of the plastics and then that would drive a change in design. Alternatively, again, it's going to sound a little bit like my, my, my plastic bottle lasting forever, but you could argue that this chemical is not very, uh, is somewhat harmful, but we have no evidence that it comes out. So maybe there's a little less onus on the manufacturer to change. So, so that's where I see our research going is to answer that question. Hey, you know, we should look for alternatives because this isn't very good. Or we should probably still look for alternatives, but we don't have the science doesn't say that uh, uh, that these current chemicals are going to be very harmful. And so um, yeah, I think we all want to be as green as possible. But those of you folks in, in the business sector know that it's always a balance, right? We're trying to be completely green while still doing things like keeping our business afloat and things like that. So we the other option. As I said, my work has been more toward the environmental angle. I think this, the question also involved this idea of what other things besides environment uh, is there. And so it could be like, oh, we can save money uh, if we switch to this additive or, you know, uh, or again, it's just the right thing to do. We don't know it's, uh, we don't know if there's an environmental problem with this chemical, but just on the surface of it, if we didn't have to use it, we know there's no problem. So that could be just, again, uh, business could be driven by a, a sort of a social license. Uh, even in the absence of a, a clear um, environmental problem. So there are all those reasons that the questioner, I think, listed that, that, that are relevant in this, this discussion. Um, yeah, I think we, we, we're balancing our optimism and our idealism with our pragmatism uh, and saying, we're gonna move forward and make this a better world um, with caveats. <laughs> My, uh... My husband likes to say that my job is m manipulation, essentially. When you go into a business figuring out what, uh, who you're talking to, what their specific need is, and in that realm. And that's usually what I would say is it depends. It depends on who you're working for, who you're working with, uh, what that specific topic is of that day. Um, here's another. I think it's, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. I think we've, no, that's enough. I think we, I think we covered that. <laughs> uh, if a high school student's interested in this field, what undergrad degrees would help, help them uh, set up well for graduate work in this field? Uh, I can't be self-serving and say chemistry and environmental science, but. Uh, yeah, you, know, you can. <laughs> well, I, well, so where do you want to jump in on this, pro this problem? You know, I'm, kind of on the tail end of this, I'm saying, what are the environmental consequences? So for that, you know, you want to understand hydrology, you want to understand chemistry. And so there are a lot of environmental engineering and science degrees. Uh, I'm a pure chemist originally, but I was bored with the lab and I wanted to be outside sampling waters and not in the lab making polymers. So um, I, I used my chemistry degree and combined it with geochemistry because all this is happening in the big wide world around us. So those technical fields are important, but again, um, uh, the engineering field, like, you know, I'm not gonna solve this problem. Uh, I could might identify the problem, but a material scientist, someone who's gonna make the better plastic is, is uh, maybe the one that's gonna help solve that. And then the other side, you know, you don't have to all be scientists here. You know, it's policy. There's there's education. You know, getting this information out to people. So from the technical side, the question was kind of like leading to grad school and things like that. I think the areas of material science and environmental science and biology. You know, well, how do these things react with with cells and organisms? All those technical fields will help us with this more of the point of identifying the problem. Uh, the material science might uh, be affecting, affecting a change in the materials and the public health people and the policy people all have play a role to, to then say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go get a graduate degree in public policy so I can make sure that eco-cycle spreads. Yeah. <laughs> um. There's, there's probably a there's probably a physicist out there somewhere that said, "Hey, you left us out. You know, we're physicists, but it's all about bonds and things like that." So, so have a few yeah. physicists join in on the conversation. Maybe we can get somebody for next week then. <laughs> I'll add. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, 
So go ahead, if anybody has any further questions, add them to the chat box. I'm gonna start giving just a few quick announcements before we wrap up. We've taken up a lot of Dr. Ranville's time today. Um, so not next week, but the following week, July 22nd at 10.30, we have Dr. Jennifer Baxter, who will be on our next webinar. She's the Chief Engineer and Head of Communications and Marketing Services at the Institution of Mechanical Engineers in the UK. She's gonna be speaking on oil and plastics, how we manage changing needs in the supply chain and deliver a cleaner planet. It'll cover the upstream, effect, uh, upstream aspects of oil use and the plastics industry, how the supply chain can determine the plastics materials and how we can respond to the need to reduce plastic use. Um, so that should be a really interesting one. I'm going to throw the details into the chat box. Also in the chat box um, is a link to our YouTube playlist that has all of the past webinars that we, uh, we've run for the Green Star businesses. They weren't all public, so now they are. So please feel free to watch them, share them, and reach out if you have any questions about the materials that were referenced. Um, we don't have any other questions so far. Um, so Dr. Ranville, thank you so much for your time. This presentation it was phenomenal and very eye-opening. Um, hopefully we can definitely have one of those, uh, do a collaboration and get some kiddos out into the field. Yep. Looking forward to it. Thank you so much for your time and, and, and organizing this. Of course, it's my pleasure. All right, folks, um, one more time. This is the Green Star Business Webinar Series. Any questions, feel free to reach out. I'll be sending out a follow-up email with a link to this recording and articles referenced uh, during the presentation itself. If anybody who's a GSB wants to set up a time for a book club meeting, we are, again, reading This Changes Everything. Um, shoot me an email, we'll set up a time. All right. Have a great Wednesday, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Bye, Dr. Ranville.